The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome any visitors who are with us this morning at Southside. We are glad you've come uh, to worship with us. It's a special Lord's Day. We're going to corporately remember the Lord's table, and so that will be the central theme of our gathering. So what we're going to do in preparation for our time together uh, for the partaking of communion, and we're kind of in between books if you're visiting, so I've been able to freelance. And so this morning, I'm going to freelance if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I seek to shepherd the flock into the fullness of what God has given us uh, in the Lord's table. It's a means of grace, And I desire that every one of us draw out as much grace as possible that God has designed for us in this ordinance. And so that will be my aim this morning and what I am praying for for you. As I spent the week thinking about this ordinance, God has left us two ordinances to His church, that of baptism and the Lord's table. Throughout church history, these two two ordinances have been bloody grounds. People have actually killed each other over these issues. In 1555 to 1558, Queen Mary, who was known as Bloody Mary, killed 288 Protestant reformers. They were burned at the stake. Some of them you may know their names, Thomas Cramner, Roland Taylor, and Ridley, and Hugh Latimer. They were burned at the stake for one central issue, the Lord's table. They would not confess as truth the transubstantiation of it being the literal actual body of Jesus Christ that they were uh, re-offering during the Mass. And they were burned to death for this stance. And so the sin of brutality and murder over what Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, said the Lord's Supper is the commemoration of the greatest blessing that ever the world has enjoyed. The greatest blessing that God has ever given and we're killing each other over the issues. And so that that would be to miss the table with such evil. But to be willing to give your life for the truth that is represented at the table is a beautiful thing. And so one preacher I heard this week asked this question, which one causes more damage eternally? Brutality or the superficiality that fills our land today? The superficiality in which we approach the Lord's table, he believed, has caused more eternal damage than any. And so my prayer is that we would never resort to brutality or any form of wickedness like that. But what I desire for Southside is that we would never have a superficiality toward the Lord's table. And so my prayer this morning is to drive that from any heart that is sitting here this morning and let us find the fullness and the intended blessing of the communion table. And so to that end, I would like to pray and ask God's blessing over his word. Father, we come before you and I thank you for the night in which Jesus was betrayed. The night when the devil was at his worst in mankind. The night in which he would be betrayed. The night that would lead to a crucifixion. God, I thank you that he gave us this ordinance. He gave us this for the blessing of his bride. And so he told us that we are to do this in remembrance of him. And I pray this morning through your word, by your spirit, that you would guide us into the fullness of what Christ had in his heart and his desire when he gave this to his bride. And so God, we need you to lead us into that fullness, drive out superficiality. God, let us treasure what you've given us and let us uh, partake this morning in the fullness of what you've given. You've given us a full Christ So would we have fullness of joy as we all partake and eat his flesh and drink his blood to commune with this beautiful Christ. God, I pray that would be the fruit of the gathering of the saints at Southside Bible Church this morning. So please meet us in a beautiful, powerful way and do what only God can do. Amen. Well, as I thought over the best way to present to us All that is given in the passage. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 through 34. And I just want to give you your outline for this morning as we're going to look at seven aspects of the Lord's table for us to derive the abundant grace that is available to us as we partake of it. 
And we're going to look at a seven-point outline uh, to remember our unity, remember Jesus' sacrificial work, to remember the blessings of the new covenant, to remember the proclamation, to remember our love for the body of Christ, to remember self-examination, and then to remember the sobriety or the seriousness of this table. And so the key that I see in the Lord's table as we will begin is this word, remember. The Greek word is a beautiful word. It was, it was just the, the idea of remembrance was such a big part of Israel's history. There were so many remembrances. They'd say, here, put this up and remember. Remember God's mercy to you in this region or in this area. And this word literally meant to, to go back to a past event and to remember it in such a way that it affects your present and even your future. The table is to take us back 2,000 years ago to the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples. And what proceeded from that dinner was the greatest injustice in the history of the world, ending in torture and a grueling death of the Son of God by crucifixion. And so the table are commemorative signs of Christ to excite and confirm our faith in him and in his merits. It is a blessed time that we gather and we remember this. It's to share the beauty of the gospel in the, the face and remember what he has done to procure our safe standing with the Father this morning. That we just stare into the fullness of the gospel as a church this morning. And it's important that he inaugurated it on that night of the Passover, which was a memorial that was given to Israel of God's great deliverance when they were in bondage in Egypt and slavery and those 10 plagues that mightily God used to deliver them. We see that the Passover was a type. It was a picture of, of a greater reality that was to come. And that's this morning what we will look at. Its fulfillment is in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ to deliver us from our bondage of sin and death and the devil. How sweet this ordinance then should be to our hearts. We go all out to remember anniversaries. We go all out to remember birthdays and weddings. And this morning, I want us to go all out to remember our great salvation, the one into which angels long to look. They're amazed of the mercy that we sit in this morning, and they long to look at it. And I want us to go all out every time we remember this table of the fullness. This is better than any birthday or marriage or anything else. We have Christ, and we remember it corporately this morning. And so what we are to remember as we come to the table, I'd like to bring you to the first point then of our outline is we're to remember our unity. And I want you to flip back over to chapter 10. I just want to read a little bit of this <coughs> text for you because I think it sets so foundationally what we need to understand to grasp the communion table. So we'll start in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 10.1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. The, what I just talked about with Israel. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. They died. And now these things happen as examples for us this morning, so that we would not crave evil things as they craved. Do not be idolaters, as we looked at last Sunday, as some of them were. It is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. All of their idolatries. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. <clears throat> nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they're written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you'll be able to endure it. 
Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Anything other than Jesus Christ, flee from it. Don't be like that example of all that we saw with Israel. Don't fall into these lusts and immoralities and idolatries. Flee from them. So I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? And since there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And so here is this call in the context of of crying for our unity and not our idolatry and all the schisms that we will look at in chapter 11. Paul is emphasizing our oneness as a fellowship at the table. With the wine, he says, is the blood of Christ that has brought us into the new covenant. The bread is one and the fellowship of the body of Christ and what we are. Our oneness, our one body, our one faith, our one hope that we saw in Ephesians 4. And so I've told you before that one of my favorite aspects of communion is I love to look out as we all partake. And we just come from all walks of life here at Southside Bible Church. And we're sitting shoulder to shoulder and we have so many different tribes and tongues and races represented even in this church. And just shoulder to shoulder, heart to heart, faith to faith and hope to hope as one in Christ, looking to Christ as our blessed hope. It is unbelievable what we do and what we share. And I need you to be taken up with it more and not be individual Americans and just love the power and the beauty of the oneness of what we share together. The oneness just screams at me in this passage. I think it's really important to consider the context that Paul brings up how we partake of the communion table in chapter 11. And you'd almost expect that he's going to maybe talk about public worship and, and how it's done and what the form should look like. Uh, that, that w- that's what I would expect the context to be. Yet Paul's going to bring it up in a great section of strong rebuke to the church. There's the sin of selfishness that's going on in the Corinth church and the divisions and the sins against each other are, are vast. And he drops all of a sudden in the middle of that, this diamond for his argument is the Lord's table. Boom, schisms, fighting. Let's look at the Lord's table. The greatest event in our unity, the walls being broken down in the body of Christ, being one. The act that unites us eternally as one with Jesus Christ. And it's being partaken of in a sinful manner with divisiveness. (laughs) Partaking with... Schisms, arguments. The greatest act of love is being remembered with being surrounded by a huge lack of love for one another. And that's the one that we are remembering. It's a, it's a mockery. It's a joke. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. <laughs> Paul says, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. This isn't edifying. It isn't helpful. You're tearing each other down. In verse 18, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions, which is that word for schisms, exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. And so Paul addresses divisions in chapter 1. Some of the saints are going, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and they're fighting for which leaders and who they want to go under and all of that. And Paul rebukes it. And now there's more divisions over economics and class. And in verse 21, Paul says, For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. (laughs) So what is this? Well, the well-to-do are in this church now, and they're, they're, they're celebrating the, the table, they're having a meal, and they're oblivious to the poor. They're sitting there stuffing their faces with, I don't know, the caviar and great poupon. And they're just sitting there eating all this great stuff and all their food, and the, the poor are just sitting there and watching them do it while they have nothing to eat. And they're, they're not even noticing, they're just stuffing their faces and Some of them are just sitting there hungry, licking their lips, watching them eat. And some are even getting drunk 
right at the feast, all of our glorious wine, and we're just getting drunk at the table. And so the question for us, is any of that going on here at Southside? Because Paul's rebuking it severely, and so we need to look and say, is there any of that here as we come to the table? At the table, we need to check our heart for any outward actions of this heart or inward conduct to help us with this. I just want to press it maybe a little more. Look at verse 22. Paul says, what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. Do you want me to praise you? You're just despising the church of God by what you're doing. I heard a preacher this week flush out some of my thinking, and I want to bring it to you, of what does it mean to despise the church of God? And the question is, do you think anyone in this group in 1 Corinthians 11 thought that they were despising the church of God? And my answer is, I think no way. That's why I'm here. I love the church of God. I, I'm at the communion service. I'm here. The church of God is my life, is what I think they would tell you. I don't despise anything about the church. So what this tells me is you can love everything about the church and come every Sunday and be despising it, and some are doing it. You could be doing it by treating the church as something beneath what it is, what we learned in Ephesians 4. You're just playing with it, and you don't care about anybody else. You just care about yourself. Give me a sermon. Let me get out of here. Let me sing a song. You're just using the church for yourself. And then the whole design is for the corporate beauty of growing and giving God glory. You can despise the church easily. The bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the temple of God is what we are. And you gather and you're so wrapped up in your hunger and your thirst that you don't even see the poor in your congregation or notice. I'm so lost in me, I don't notice other needs. That's despising the poor. And it could be, you know, I've heard this, I I work hard. I budget so well that I'm not going to help people in their unfaithfulness. Because they they need to be faithful like me. And if you do everything right, everything will work out financially just like me. You better duck because it's coming. (laughs) Do not despise the church of God. And Paul's, it, it, what shocks me is it's like they're wanting Paul to commend them or something. He says, shall I commend you? Like they're expecting, man, you guys are doing a good job. And he's like, no way. And then in the light of that comes the Lord's supper. He drops it right in the middle. In verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The table is an argument against lovelessness in the body of Christ. He who was rich became poor so that we who are poor might become rich in Christ. And that breaks open my heart to every person in this body, to every culture, to every race, to every education. That that love of Christ comes in and it breaks your heart open to every person. Boom. And in all of our differences, there's now a unity in this love. And the table is where that is put on display more than anywhere else in Christendom. And so Paul says, don't you dare come to the table of Christ without the spirit of what the sacrifice bought for us. Love. Love to Christ and love to His body. All arrogance and lack of love needs to die at the table of Christ. Don't partake with that kind of spirit and those kind of divisions in your heart because it's a mockery of what you're going to hold in your hands and what you're going to drink. Remember our unity at the table. Secondly, our second point is to remember Jesus' death. To remember 
that he delivered, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so what I think happens at this table is we get busy. I think the greatest battle in American culture is our busyness. And all just keep moving. There's never a break. There's so much social media. It's always constant and moving. And even in the church and in my families and evangelism and structure and government and building committees and all of these things and, and then with my work and technology that brings the whole world into our phones. And I'm just telling you, it goes on and on and on. And we can go a week and never spend more than a few minutes meditating on the death of Jesus Christ, the old, old story of what Jesus has done. And we slow down and we stare it right in the face that Christ Jesus died for me. So at the table, slow down and remember. Remember that he, he came and it was the night in which he was being betrayed. The greatest evil that was ever known in the history of the world is being plotted. And he's sitting at a table with his disciples and he says, come sit with me in all of my love at, at the table. And he invites all of you here this morning. Remember. Remember that he gave thanks to God, the one who had planned his whole death. He gave him thanks. Thanks. And he breaks the bread and says, this is my body, which is for you. I choose for this body to be broken for you. And I choose to spill out all of my blood for you. And I want you to remember the Garden of Gethsemane when he looked in that cup and he sweat drops of blood and he chose to go to the cross rather than to flee it. How willing he was. He hung on a tree in my place. And Jesus says, I will not eat this with you again until glory will we will sit and eat and drink and celebrate with him again forever. And then I love it as he goes now to the hardest event ever. They sing a song together and they worship and they go out. And so this morning, I, I want you to remember, I, I want you to remember the beauties and the glories of Christ Jesus as a sacrificial lamb for you. So we need to remember our unity. We need to remember Jesus' death. And one other point in verse 24, I want to remember the new covenant. As he says, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But then he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so remember the new covenant. The new covenant in my blood. And so as we partake, it's so good. It's remember the whole biblical theology of all that God has planned since the fall. And he said, I'll restore it. And we, we look at Moses and we trace through David and all the way to Isaiah and to, to Christ and Abraham. And so it's just, there's a, there's a remembrance of this whole redemptive plan of what God has done, where it's been moving and it's climaxing this moment on that table, that last supper. Remember, here's the new covenant. Here is what God has promised being fulfilled in our midst. And so I want to pull up Jeremiah 31, verse 31, where he tells us what this new covenant will be. And then Jeremiah says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. I was a husband and they broke it, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the day this night with Christ, declares the Lord. I'll put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord." And I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. And so as you drink the wine this morning, your lips are savoring the new covenant that we stand in right now. We, we stand in grace. Uh, we remember this this morning. And that God will put his law within us and upon our hearts he'll write the law. 
And so we remember this morning that this cross is how God wrote the law in our hearts. And now his commandments are not burdensome. And they're our greatest delight and our treasure and our joy. And so we just remember of how much we delight now to do the will of God. And I just, I love a new heart, don't you? And just remember, God gave me this new heart. And then I, I will be their God and they will be my people. And so at the table by faith, we're, we're, we're proclaiming we're the people of God. And just look around this morning at your brothers and sisters and just remember together, he's our God and we're his people. The beauty of this gospel is not just forgiveness. What, what, what Robert preached on is God. You, just, you get God, we're his people. And so we're remembering this morning the beauties that I get God. And thirdly, each one shall know the Lord. Every member who's born again knows God. They know him. They're intimate. We're not defined by being born into the covenant people of God, but being born again into the covenant people of God. And everyone in the new covenant will know this God. You'll be intimate and you will have fellowship with him, and I will forgive your iniquities and your sins. I will remember no more. So as we come and drink that cup and remember the new covenant, my sins were dealt with. He remembers them no more. East is from the west. We got to celebrate like no other this morning. My sins are gone. God doesn't even remember them. And I'm just here remembering that this morning. I'm so overwhelmed and full that all the sin that I'm aware of, he remembers it no more because he put it on Jesus and fully disciplined him and poured out his wrath and destroyed him on that cross. And so we come to the table. We must remember the sweet unity that we have. And we got to remember Jesus' death. And then I want you to remember the fullness of the new covenant and all that we possess now as the people of God. And then fourthly, I want you to remember the proclamation that will be made this morning while we partake of this table. Look with me in verse 26. <clears throat> For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so the table of the Lord is for Christians. There, there is no benefit for any unbeliever partaking. It's met with faith, and it's for the believers who see what this sacrifice has done. But I pray every Sunday that there would be unbelievers in our midst and so if you've come in here this morning and you're an unbeliever, man, I just welcome you. I am so glad you are here. Just come. And this morning you get to watch a proclamation. And that word means to declare, to publish, to make known, or to advertise. We're going to proclaim to you the gospel. We're going to proclaim that this bread and cup that we're about to eat and drink represent the whole hope of what a Christian is that Jesus' body was broken on a cross and his blood was poured out in death for us in our place so that we could be forgiven of all of our sins and accepted by God. We're rejoicing and remembering right here. You get to watch it. You get to watch what this does to believers and new hearts and forgiven and changed. Just take it in, watch it, and, and covet it. Want what every believer around you has this morning. It's by faith looking to Jesus and not by your works, just looking at Christ this morning and what he has done. And so I would that you would believe in a beautiful dying Christ this morning as you watch such a beautiful ordinance. Fifthly, we are to remember our hope until he comes. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so every time uh, we remember, uh, we come back to this, uh, that we're waiting and we're, we're waiting for our bridegroom. And when the Passover was celebrated, the people would say, next year in Jerusalem as they left or until he comes. And so as we partake, we're, we're, we're waiting until he comes. And we say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Every time we remember this, we're safe. We love our Savior and we love him so much. We want him back right now. And so let's remember with, a, with an eye of the hope saying, as we remember this sacrifice, come back. I don't need five years to clean up my life. Or, so, you know, I just want you to come back this morning because I have this blessed hope. So let's remember this morning that this table bought us a safety when Christ returns to establish 
his new kingdom. And so we will drink of the fruit of the vine with him in the messianic kingdom. Come, Lord Jesus, as we remember this morning, please hasten. Come. We desire your return. So first, we remember our unity. We remember Jesus' death. We remember the beauties of the new covenant and what this has purchased. We remember the proclamation of what is being proclaimed. And we remember our great blessed hope that Christ is coming again. And now, sixthly, I want to remember our examination. And this is going to be important for us in verse 27. We get a therefore in light of how beautiful this ordinance is and what we're to remember. In light of that, then, there's something very important that's connecting to the Lord's table. So therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And so now we we come, and this is such a weighty, beautiful, gorgeous ordinance. Therefore, you better come uh, not in an unworthy manner, or you're going to eat, be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And so we come now. uh, We don't want to come in an unworthy manner. And so this is big to me, is what's unworthy? I don't want to come to the table in an unworthy way. That's weighty. Well, the Greek word for unworthy, it meant scale or weights. And it would signify unequal weights. It meant to be out of balance. So don't come to the Lord's table out of balance with your heart and your mind and your conduct not according with these sacred elements. To not be out of balance with what you're remembering. Sitting here just indulging in any sin you want, breaking up the body, being selfish, and now I'm going to come and remember the table. That's out of balance. You're not coming in a worthy manner. Your life is not in agreement with what you're remembering. And I want to try and flesh that out much for us. He's worthy for you to come. And they, they're, as they're going, they're coming back, and, and Jairus sends out and says, no, I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy. Just say the word, and, and, and the, my servant will be healed. And so no unbeliever can partake of communion in a worthy manner in your person. So that's kind of freeing when you begin to, okay, so it's not who I am, and that's my next point, is this is an adverb, not an adjective. So you must come unworthy of grace, and second, you must come uh, with this, an an adverb is the manner in which we do it, an adjective describes the person who can approach. And so we are now in Christ, and we're worthy in Christ to come to this table. So Christ makes you worthy this morning but there is a manner in which you can come that's unworthy. This table is for believers and sinners. But how we approach is what is worthy or unworthy. And so the greatest of sinners who believes in Jesus Christ can come in a worthy manner to this table. And so I want you to catch that. And thirdly, I want you to stay in the context in Paul's words. And let's try to figure out, and what happens is everyone starts importing a million things into this context of What is a worthy manner? And I'm going to come back to the context because I want you to get this. To come unworthily is mistreating the body of Christ and the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's our context. To come with a judgmental spirit, keeping yourselves from the body of Christ and withholding, condescending the poor and races and other cultures. Any kind of racism in your heart is unworthy. Unforgiveness in your heart toward a brother or sister. And I don't care what you say with your mouth. If there's unforgiveness in your heart, you're unworthy to come to this table. The table is the place for all of this to be repented of and to be dealt with. Jesus said, don't bring your offering if you know that your brother has something against you until you go and make it right. He says, then you can come and worship. To sit at this table with unforgiveness in your heart while holding the elements of the greatest forgiveness that makes God remember your sins no more. (laughs) Is there a greater forgiveness known to man? But you're out of balance with the elements. If you're sitting here with unforgiveness in your heart, I think God has designed this to be a check for the body of Christ to look and say, is my heart 
out of balance with the greatest act of forgiveness that has ever been known to man. It's, it's unworthy manner. The table is the place to put an end to this in your heart. So that we'll be the bride that God calls us to be, where everyone's seeing the unity and the beauty and the oneness. And, and when that's put on display, God is worshiped and adored. And God cares about that a lot. You're going to see as we journey this morning. And I think the other, as I look at this, is maybe sin in general. And so what I'm getting at, it, this isn't an, an, uh, a scrutinizing abuse, looking for every sin. I read one man who said, you know, in, in the Passover, they would go through the whole house and look for even a little breadcrumb of leaven. You know, and so they would look and they, they would get even the crumbs out. And so you must search your heart for any crumb of sin that could be found in it, and you'll spend hours of confession. That's not what's going on here at this table. But it's a time to stop and remember what Christ has done to save you from sin and break its bondage and dominion. And in 1 Peter 4, to arm yourself with the same attitude towards sin that was in Christ Jesus. And so this is a time to stop and maybe a great time for spouses to ask, do we have the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace this morning in our marriage? Is it in your house? Maybe there's some kids that you're, you're just fighting your parents and being rebellious and, and this morning you need to repent at the table and love that God has given you parents who want to protect you and point you to Jesus Christ. This spirit of the age rising up against parents, this is, it stops at the table. And, and, and parents, all of us, this is a place where we look and we come back to the unity and the oneness of what we have in Christ and we repent of divisiveness and unforgiveness and sin uh, in our hearts. Be at peace with as much, as much as possible with you, with all men, is okay at the table. I've tried to reconcile. I've tried to be at peace. There are moments where all you can do is leave it to God. You can come to the table. But I'm going to ask you to repent and say, I will not treat, treat the church of God as something cheap. And I'm going to renounce my attitudes and my actions as I look at the greatest unity that there could ever be in remembering the communion table and what Christ has done. And I'm not going to sit here just holding to willful sin. This is a place where I check. And I just look at my heart. And is it surrendered to you, Christ? And as I remember this morning, I'm going to release my willful defiance to God in any way. So this is a beautiful time to repent of hearts that have drifted from Christ and running into all kinds of sins and rebellion. then you can eat worthily. And I want you to trust Jesus to forgive all of these attitudes and all of these sins that are not giving Him glory and they're weighty and that He will help you to grow in these things. And so I want you to remember that I will remember your sins no more. And so I want you to find full forgiveness at the table this morning that as we confess them, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're looking at the foundation of how, what causes me to repent and what cleanses me as I repent at the table. Hallelujah. <laughs> the table is a table of grace. It is the new covenant and it just preaches the grace of God that he would give his son to us in such a manner. So in summary, what this is saying is don't receive Christ with your hands and your mouth this morning while you reject him in your heart and you reject his body. That's what he's getting at. John Calvin said to do the table aright, you must bring faith and repentance to the table. And so I pray that we would bring both this morning. And he said it's not a perfect faith or a perfect repentance that you bring to the table but it's a faith that looks to this Christ and remembering him and it repents for any of these spirits and attitudes that I'm holding to this morning. So I love that he gave us the table to check these things and to renounce them and to repent and to restore and reconcile as the body of Christ. So who cares? 
if I treat the body of Christ any way I want. I've been told that. <laughs> Sundays is enough. That's all I got time for. I don't have to like everybody in this body. <laughs> I serve in other places at, at the prisons. I don't need to come to your church. And, and there's just attitudes, and you're like, what's, what's the big deal? And so I hate to tell you it's a big deal, and I'm going to close with something very sobering in our last seventh point. I want you to remember God's covenantal judgment, and I don't want you to skim over these verses. Look with me then uh, in verse 28, but a man must examine himself. That's what we just looked at. And in so doing, he can eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep, which is death. <laughs> but if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined. That's what God does to his children. We're disciplined, who? By the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with this fallen, unregenerate world. <laughs> Unbelievable what is being said here. This passage has hit me like a sledgehammer this week. Does God care if we partake of his table in an unworthy manner? Do you want to put a battery on your shoulder and say, I dare you to knock it off, God? You better believe it. This needs to hold a weight on the hearts of God's children to come worthily to the table. To think of why people used to die for it. They used to give their lives for it in the 1500s. And just how lightly it sits on the church today in many places. And so I just want you to see as Paul closes this out, this demands our sobriety. There's something lost from the people of God is sobriety. We need great joy and great sobriety. Remember it says, behold God, it's a terrifying, he's, he's uh, merciful and he's also fearful. We should be fearing him, have both. Everything is just so light and emotional today. The table should be filled with so much joy in the new covenant, but there needs to be a sobriety as we come with both this morning. Do you hear what the Spirit is testifying through Paul. He's saying that there are instances of sickness and even death that are the Lord's judgment for those who are making a mockery of the table of the Lord. They're temporal judgments. It's covenantal love because he says he's disciplining his own. And he, he will even bring discipline to some who will make a mockery of this and act like God doesn't care about my life, what I do, my bitterness, my hatreds, just nothing matters. God loves his children. And this probably deserves a whole sermon on itself. I'll leave that to the elders when I leave um, because of how different this is than most thinking today. And I'll just tell you right now, I don't have all the answers to this verse, but just don't miss something very clear at least. This is not saying every sickness and every death is because of sin at the table. That's just wrong. There are times in the Bible, who sinned, the parents, what? And he said, this, this is for the glory of God. And there are just times that God will call us home in all different reasons. So there's many times you'll die with no connection to sin except Adam's. So I don't know how it really works fully. I can't flush it all out. You know what it could be? Stress and bitterness of a soul that won't forgive. And it's like a cancer. I've watched it. And you, it starts to take away your health, and you get sick. And you're like, I don't know if it's that or if he just snapped. I, I have no idea. It's a tricky verse to understand, but not that tricky in the sense, I think, of what it's saying. God cares about what was going on in Corinth. Their unloving attitudes and their spirits at the table. And there's been a covenantal judgment upon some in that church that are sick and some have died. Because God really cares that the body of Christ manifest His manifold wisdom to this world of our unity and the gospel and the oneness. This is what the church is designed for and God cares about it. And if you want to make a mockery of it, uh, it, it matters to God in a very, very deep way. He cares that the body causes the growth of the body and that it stays healthy and puts his name on display. The gospel is proclaimed from the church and it matters 
if you have unforgiveness and bitterness and defiant sin and unreconciled relationships. There's a seriousness about God at this table. So Paul has written this to us so that we can come freely and joyfully. He wants this to be a joyful remembrance of what he has done for us in Christ. But to come worthily, he wants us to examine ourselves and to repent and to come in accordance with these elements of letting go of these bitternesses and these sins and believe and remember the Lamb where you can find full forgiveness for every sin that you came in with this morning where God will not even remember them anymore. That's what we remember this morning. So don't, don't hold them. Bring them to God and let them be forgiven and you can remember even more joyfully. And so maybe during this time of examination, some of you need to even go up to somebody in this body and just hug them and let them know. Maybe you need to call a spouse Maybe a child needs to go up to a dad and mom this morning and just repent for your attitude and your spirit. This is a a beautiful time to get in a line with the most beautiful sacrifice that's ever been made for mankind. How can you hold to willful sin while you're holding to the one who emptied himself even to the point of being obedient to death and death on a cross? There's a remedy for your sin this morning. I lift high the cross of Christ and beg that everyone would look at him and look your eyes out this morning and that we would remember him at the table. And so I want joy uh, at this table. And I want us to partake together now and we're going to do a time of examination over what I just shared and we're going to pass out the elements. And so these elements are, are for believers and believers who can partake in a worthy manner And so get your hearts ready. Every believer, you're worthy because of Christ. Get your attitudes and hearts and sins. Just get it in in, in alignment and balance with these beautiful elements. And then we will gather and we will remember together. So let me pray and they'll pass out the elements. Father, I thank you for what you gave us. I thank you for this ordinance of the Lord's table. And I desire for every soul in here to get the fullness of the grace that we are about to remember. I love the new covenant. I love your plan of redemptive history and we live under the new covenant. And I pray that no heart would take that for granted and we would treasure it. And to, to think of all of our sins being remembered no more because of Christ. Looking at how our sins were forgiven. You didn't just blow them away, but you poured out your wrath on your own son. God, let our hearts be full. Let us remember this in such a way that our hearts are taken up with love to Christ. Let us be eating and drinking his flesh this morning in fellowship and communion with this beautiful Savior. And I just pray now for every one of our hearts, Lord, that no one would hold to just bitterness and unforgiveness and sin and and just defiance to you, God. Let all of that be repented and dropped now at the table and let us remember with freedom and fullness of joy as we realize that even those sins now are remembered no more. Oh God, let the people of God rejoice and their great God. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.